Good afternoon, and welcome to another one of CWTA's virtual events. I'm Robert Giz, and I'm president and CEO of the Canadian Wireless Telecommunications Association. This is our third event of our virtual series called 5G Canada, What's Next? Bonjour tout le monde et bienvenue à notre troisième événement virtuel sur la future du 5G au Canada. Cette série nous donne l'occasion de regarder aux tendances et aux innovations dans des secteurs particuliers. This series gives us a chance to look at trends and innovation in, this, in specific sectors and the role that 5G will play in that future. Past studies sponsored by CWTA have looked at the economic impact that 5G will have in Canada, as well as the benefits it will bring to cities and rural communities. We have also looked at the impact that 5G will have on reducing Canada's carbon footprint. And all of these reports can be found on our cwta.ca and 5gcc.ca websites. Based on many of these reports, we know that through the adoption of 5G, approximately 250,000 permanent full-time jobs will be added to the Canadian economy by 2026. It is also estimated that we'll add an additional $40 billion to our GDP by that same year. We also estimate, and we know, that this will take a massive investment by Canada's facilities-based carriers. It will take an investment upwards of $26 billion by the year 2026. Accenture also estimates that with the impl implementation of 5G, mobile technologies will have the potential to account for up to 23% of Canada's current emission reduction targets by the year 2025. These numbers provide Canada with a great opportunity. A great opportunity to one, grow our economy and create good jobs. To connect more Canadians, especially those living in rural areas, and three, to reduce down our carbon footprint. It's a win-win-win situation for Canada and for Canadians. But what we need to make this happen is a stable regulatory environment that supports facilities-based competition in Canada. To get back to today, today our speakers will discuss 5G and the automotive sector. Our panel will touch on the latest advancements in automotive technology and how connected vehicles, including 5G enabled vehicles, will help improve the travel experience for consumers. We're fortunate to have some great presenters with us, with us today, Hervé Ufesa and Grant Corville. Today we'll be moderated by our SVP at the CWTA, Eric Smith, and I'll turn it over to him for a better introduction of today's panelists and I hope everyone enjoys today's presentation. Thanks, Robert, and uh, good morning, good afternoon to everyone, depending on where you are. Um, you know, over the last five years or more, we've heard a lot about autonomous vehicles. Will we ever see truly autonomous vehicles? And if so, when? But while this discussion's been ongoing, uh, it's been, an, an equally important transformation taking place in the automotive industry. Uh, the connected car uh, and the value that connectivity and data from connected cars will deliver for car owners, for car manufacturers, which are often referred to as OEMs, and the rest of the auto industry um, is something that is less reported. Uh, the consulting firm McKinsey estimates that by 2030, 95% of new vehicles sold globally will be connected. And whether it's through the ability to update and unlock new hardware and software features, uh, a more seamless in-car experience and personalized maintenance, better safety and security, uh, or better road planning and optimization, uh, connected cars and the data generated by them will deliver a better and safer uh, driving experience and more efficient transportation systems, while also creating revenue opportunities and cost savings. Telecom operators will play a crucial role in enabling this transformation, and 5G will be a big part of this. Uh, Juniper Research estimates that the 30 million vehicles with 
embedded 5G connectivity uh, will be on the roads by 2025. And that 25% of data generated by vehicles will be attributable to 5G in that same time period. So to explore these themes uh, further, we have two great experts uh, with us today. Uh, we really appreciate the, their time. I know they're very busy and it's great that they can share their perspective on this with us. And first up, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Grant Corville from uh, BlackBerry QNX. And Grant's gonna walk us through a bit of the evolution, the technological evolution uh, that we're seeing in the automotive industry and uh, what it means in terms of delivering new capabilities and new driving experiences. So uh, Grant, I'd like to welcome you to the stage. Glad to be here, thanks Eric. Um, so I'd like to thank Robert, Eric, Chantel, and the whole team at CWTA uh, for the opportunity uh, to present today. So I'm gonna talk a bit about, um, you know, very a bit about uh, what we're doing at BlackBerry QNIX, and then we'll talk a bit about technology evolution and obviously connectivity and the impact uh, and the promise that connectivity has in terms of the automotive or transportation industry, and more broadly speaking, smart cities, smart infrastructure, and whatnot. Um, so why don't we, there we go. So first, a little bit about, uh, about BlackBerry and Cunix. Uh, so Cunix is a, was a privately held company founded in 1980. We were acquired by BlackBerry in 2010. Um, from an automotive perspective, we've been in automotive since about 1998. So a little over 20 years. We're a Canadian company. Uh, BlackBerry is headquartered in Waterloo. Um, the core of Cunix is in Ottawa, Ontario, which is, which is where I'm based. Uh, I've been with Cunix, I'll say, since, uh, since the early days, and, and it's truly been a pleasure to, to be part of it all. From an automotive perspective, um, as you can see, we're in a little over 100, well, well over 175 million vehicles now uh, on the road today. And so we build software. We don't build the systems in the cars. We build the software, the foundational software, the operating systems that you'll find in the, in the various systems in the car. And as you can see, we work with a number of automakers we work with a number of what are called tier ones. So essentially, they're the suppliers to the automakers that are building the systems that go into cars. Um, and as you can see here, it's really a mix of, I'll say, your volume and traditional automakers, as well as your new entrants, um, and definitely a global perspective. So you'll see some brands there like Plus.ai and Neo and Xpeng, uh, together with the, you know, the, the Detroit 3 GM Ford, uh, Chry Chrysler Stellantis, obviously now. Um, so we've had quite a bit of experience in automotive uh, and that we're quite proud of. We're trusted in automotive. We're very unique. In fact, we're the only company in Canada that does what we do. Um, and very few companies in the world do what we do in terms of safety critical software for the systems in cars. I can go to the next slide. There we go. Oh, back, sorry. So in terms of software, you've probably heard terms like software-defined vehicle, software-defined car, really the evolution of the car is, uh, is what I'll talk about in a minute. From a Cunix perspective, we were first known uh, for infotainment. Back in the late 90s, early 2000s, infotainment systems, which is essentially the, the, the display typically in the center of your dashboard, um, it was projected and known and really was the most complex system in the car in terms of the amount of software and integration into one system in the vehicle. Um, so that's where we started out. And obviously since then, uh, we're powering telematic systems, for instance, like GM OnStar. And as the car adopts more and more software, essentially you're seeing adoption of safety critical in our software throughout the vehicle. We won't have time to get into necessarily a lot of details here, um, but just know that the software is, or the vehicle, sorry, is becoming much more software defined. Um, and to expand on that just a little bit, and you may have seen similar um, uh, references before, but the number of systems in the car is growing. Uh, although I'll add a little footnote to that, which relates to the, the middle of the screen here, uh, where you're going to see consolidation of systems in the car. But the number of ECUs or embedded systems in the car uh, has been growing. The amount of software in the car has been growing, and that's not going to slow down. There's going to be more and more software in the vehicle as the years go on, and more and more of the vehicle will be software controlled. As I mentioned earlier, there's quite a few uh, ECUs or systems in the car. What everybody's doing now is slowly moving towards what are called domain controllers. So you're going to see multiple computers in the car, systems in the car combined into one. 
and those one system, the, the, the domain controllers and the cockpit of the car is a classic example, it's going to take on more, more control of what multiple systems used to do. And again, that's where safety critical software, which is ultra reliable, ultra safe, ultra secure, comes into play. And, and that's what we do. As you can see, the amount of electronics in the, and software in the vehicles is going to grow at a very rapid pace as well. So all this is happening. You might not be aware of it. You're probably driving even vehicles with newer vehicle where you're seeing many more safety features and, and many more elements of the car being software controlled. So let's talk about connectivity. Um, from a connectivity perspective, essentially, and, and I'm not going to get wrapped around the axle on, on the numbers, but the, the directional uh, the, the, in terms of where things are going, as, um, uh, as Eric mentioned earlier, more and more vehicles are becoming connected for very good reasons, and it's happening globally. So there's more modems going in cars. Um, you're starting to see 5G, you had 4G, you've got Wi-Fi, I mean, all things that we're, we're very aware of. Um, in terms of all the data references you hear in terms of data from the vehicle to something external from the car, absolutely the biggest um, consumer of data and sharing of data is between the vehicle and the cloud. That's the way it is today, and that's going to be the way it is going forward, which is why you see the Amazons and Microsofts and Googles and others get involved. That vehicle is going to become essentially an extension of your digital life. It's going to be essentially a connected device, uh, the, the mobile device on, on wheels, if you like. I mean, these are all things you've heard. Um, and you'll also see a number of acronyms. You know, I, I'm sharing some of them here. So, you know, V to C, V to D. Essentially, they all mean vehicle communications to something external to the vehicle. And there's various use cases and benefits that, that come along with that. So the automakers have absolutely realized that. Uh, cities have absolutely realized that. Uh, the notion of having a car which has more and more sensors in it, being able to participate in smart cities and IoT at large has tremendous benefits, um, which is why you're seeing this connectivity occur. So here's an interesting chart I thought I'd put up. Um, historically, what people were looking for was obviously horsepower and whatnot, and then it shifted to infotainment. Then you saw more safety features being a primary interest. And from a connectivity perspective, and I thought this was interesting uh, in, in 2020 from IBM uh, and the survey that they did, really consumers are looking for a lot of the features that you see here. So again, being able to extend my digital life to the vehicle, be able to diagnose, uh, being able to implement prognostics of so predictive analytics, for instance, to personalize the vehicle. And none of these, almost any, none of these are possible without a connected car. Um, and there's some challenges coming up in terms of the connectivity. It's not as easy as you can imagine as just putting a modem in the car um, and all of a sudden these things will magically appear. But the consumer is very aware of the benefits of connectivity, um, and uh, these are some of the uh, the elements that that can bring forward. Here's where you get into some of the challenges. So, from a vehicle perspective, it really is a bespoke set of systems where the data and access to data is also very bespoke. There's no standard across all of the automakers or even across vehicle lines where the OEM can get easily get access to data. You've got multiple sensors and more and more being uh, put into the vehicle. Guess what, the data from them all comes in various different formats. Um, and again, as it stands today, you don't have that common access. So if you think of a mobile phone, I've got Android, I got iOS, and there's various frameworks and I can build apps on top of it and that's for the whole ecosystem. That's not the case in automotive. Everything is bespoke. Uh, some people would use the word proprietary. So it's still pretty closed and there's no easy way to attract developers because I have no platform that I can build on. Um, well, I have no commonality of data, or commonality of APIs. So because it's a bes these bespoke systems, I don't get any scale. I can't attract the developers. So there's this real challenge that's there today. Um, and it's recognized across the world by all of the automakers. And you got some automakers trying to build their own systems. Um, you've got some of the cloud uh, providers also trying to solve that problem. It is a big problem. Uh, because, again, the lifespan of a vehicle and the systems in the vehicle, and again, safety being top priority uh, within the vehicle, these are all things that, you know, cannot be compromised going forward. So OEMs see this tremendous opportunity from a connectivity perspective. From a, a product design, if they can get access to the data, they can learn a lot more about how you're operating the vehicle, how the vehicle operates. Today, automakers really don't know what features you're using in the car, which features you're not using, which features are, you're finding it difficult to get at. They really don't have any insight 
into the vehicle at all. Um, again, as we can get into things like uh, a predictive analytics and whatnot, we can do targeted recalls. There's huge benefits across, you know, huge digital transformation opportunity, I should say, across the whole IT landscape for OEMs. Um, it, the, the benefits that connectivity can bring to vehicles is definitely not lost on any of the automakers, the tier ones ourselves or anybody else uh, within the ecosystem. More specifically, um, in terms of the, the two buckets, if you like, in terms of categories, if we can solve the, the challenges I mentioned earlier, all of a sudden it opens the door to tremendous value from a revenue generation perspective. And that's not just with the automakers, that's across the whole ecosystem, as well as cost reduction. And these are, are some of the examples that you, uh, that you see here. Um, just recently, in fact, in December, we announced a partnership with AWS and we announced a product called BlackBerry Ivy to solve those challenges, to provide common access to data through common APIs, common representation of the data, cloud connected that'll run on any operating system, support any cloud, really trying to big that plat bring that platform to automotive. Essentially, enable that developer ecosystem, enable those frameworks, add the intelligence in the vehicle. Um, and from a Cunix perspective, we're experts at in-vehicle technology, obviously AWS, the largest cloud provider in the world. That partnership made absolute sense. And that's what we're doing with BlackBerry Ivy to enable the OEMs um, to be able to realize that value. And so lastly, I wanted to kind of bring it home, and it was quite timely. Um, so last week, yeah, May 20th. So these are a few quotes, and I, I put the link in here when they share the presentation. These are a few quotes from Jim Farley at Ford, the CEO of Ford that he made. Um, Ford, like just about every other OEM, has realized the value of data. And I won't read all of this, um, but as you can see, they realize the value of connectivity. Connectivity is so important. Um, and we saw the chart earlier with the adoption of 5G, and we'll, we'll talk, probably talk about that a bit later um, in terms of 5G and whatnot, um, and DSRC and, and V2X, I'll say more in general. But you can see some of the very specific items that Jim Farley has quoted. Um, and you're seeing some very strong statements. In other words, connectivity being a game changer, a software first organization. This is Ford. This is Ford who builds vehicles. They've realized that, hey, we need to be a software first company. Other OEMs have said we need to be mobility companies, for instance. They, I mean, he in fact mentions it here, the network vehicle, the connected vehicle is gonna be very similar to your phone and really become that computer on wheels. And just today, um, uh, Jim mentioned that they just announced the, I think it's called, yeah, Blue Oval Intelligence. And it's a cloud-based next generation platform, connected platform that integrates systems for power, electrical, software, and computing. So they're all in, 100% all in on vehicle connectivity. And with, with the, the Blue Oval system that they have, um, he mentioned that by next summer, they'll have more connected vehicles than Tesla, and they'll have actually 33 million connected vehicles by 2028. So very aggressive. Uh, which is really impressive, I should say. So you're going to see more and more automaker announcements like this, but here's a very recent example of a company, Ford, a leading automaker, tremendous experience, obviously, all in on software, all in on connectivity and bringing intelligence to the vehicle. Um, and with that, I will pass the ball back to Eric. Thanks a lot, Grant. That, that was a great overview and uh... Whenever I see your presentations, I'm just always in awe of, of the scope of what's happening in automotive. And really, as you said, cars are moving from, you know, metal benders and, you know, people putting wheels on metal to really building sophisticated mm -hmm. computer systems. And I've and, uh, got lots of questions for you. But I want to turn now for a moment, you know, Grant talked kind of about the architecture of a vehicle and how it's changing from, you know, needing a lot of mechanical engineers to need, need a lot of electronic and software engineers. Um, but also data is a big part of that because in order to utilize this computing power, the car both generates a lot of data and will consume a lot of data um, for the different purposes that Grant's laid out. So I wanna welcome onto the stage, uh, Irve, uh, I'll, I'll butcher your last name, Uteza, is that right? Uteza, absolutely. Uteza, a senior director of emerging technologies at Here Technologies. Here, some of you may not have heard of it. It's got a very interesting lineage and uh, a very powerful uh, location data solution. And so uh, everybody's going to tell us a little bit about that. So welcome, everybody. Thank you, Eric. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody, wherever you are. 
I'm a review Tisa. Yes, I do manage the emerging technologies at Here Technologies. Enchanté de faire votre connaissance. Uh, je peux parler français aussi, mais je vais revenir sur l'anglais dans quelques secondes. Um, merci pour votre attention. Um, I'm going to tell you a little story about HEAR technology in three phases. First of all, introduce the company. Uh, many of you may be in the car that you're driving. You may be using us without knowing it. We are a very large global uh, neutral location data and services provider that powers many, many of the industries uh, of the world. And so we are a 35-year-old company, so I'll tell you a little bit about our history and, and what we're doing. Then I'm going to explain or talk a little bit about the evolution of this mapping world. The map uh, industry, the location services industry is in an immense digital transformation. And those moving objects on the road are going through an evolution. Grant talked about the soft revolution. We are seeing the connectivity to the infrastructure. And then ultimately, there's a change of experience for the end users and the consumer, which translates into why 5G, what is the value of 5G? Is 5G different than the quantum leap from 3G to, 4, uh, to 3G to 4G? And then we'll close with a couple of business observations about the market that we see in the different timelines in the different regions. And of course, bringing it back here to, to North America. So here technologies, um, and I'm going to push the button. I'm not sure I have the control quite yet. There you go. Thank you. Um, the uh, history of here technologies is a long, rich history. We're about 35 years old company. We started as an Aftec, actually here in the Silicon Valley, where I'm at. And we grew to be a mapping provider, making data, digital data for the map of the infotainment system that Grant talked about in the, in the uh, car. Uh, initially delivering the map data as part of a software package that gets added and in the, the, the ROM and the RAM of the, of the vehicle on the, on the manufacturing floor, moving to those old shiny digital disk objects, the CD-ROM. We still actually have a business, imagine that, of, of updating our map through CD-ROM uh, to direct to, to consumers in support of our car makers, uh, customers. Um, and we grew uh, out of that to be for a while uh, Nokia Maps on the mobile phone. So we went and so and, and supported the evolution to the digital mobile phone. And about five years ago, um, when Nokia changed who they were, as you remember very well, um, some of our automotive OEM customers decided to build and to bring uh, this company under their wing. And so Audi, BMW, and Daimler created a consortium uh, and we became Here Technologies. And that consortium has since then expanded uh, with uh, investment from Intel, Pioneer, Bosch, Continental, NTT, and Mitsubishi. And now we are a global neutral player in the space of location services. Uh, I'm using the term neutral in the sense that we're a B2B player. That's why you do not hear much from us when you look at a here map on a connected vehicle. And we have also expanded into many, many different uh, industries um, and, uh, indust and, uh, and customer uh, base. So what do we do? Mapping really is a set of data layers uh, covered by a set of web services and APIs that deliver that data and that enable our customers and our partners to build application services um, on top of it and to exploit the value of location intelligence. We do have some application and, and, and systems and full systems as well. Uh, as we evolved to go from the automotive business, we have some infotainment uh, systems. We went into transportation and logistics. So we have an asset uh, tracking and management system. We have a fleet management system that helps fleets and transportation and logistics companies of the world to move the package from the uh, warehouse delivery, deliver from the warehouse to your to your doorstep. 
Um, and we do this with the same infrastructure that is repeated over and over into different configuration and integration uh, uh, deployment scenarios. We do this um, across many different use cases. For telecommunication service providers in particular, we are helping them and we have done a, a key agreement with Verizon that we announced a year and a half ago, two years ago, where we are powering many of the location services of uh, Verizon um, and uh, many other industry use cases. We have a team approaching the public sector environment, smart cities. We have a team going after the transport and transportation and logistics, as I mentioned. We are starting to see 5G in industrial warehousing. What happens suddenly when you're bringing in the power of uh, Mac, the, the mobile edge compute, with the processing in the plant of all those movements of the robots, of the humans in the plant, the assets, the pallets that will go from the manufacturing floor to the loading dock, to the truck, to the distribution warehouse, and uh, ultimately to your, to your doorstep. We are seeing 5G approach and cut across all those industries. Because the way that I personally look at it is that 5G is opening up uh, in front of us an era of precision. And uh, sometimes we'll maybe save that for the q and I ask myself whether 5G should not be renamed 1T or, or a different object because 5G brings with it lots of different uh, value uh, proposition and benefits than the pure bandwidth improvement, which what's, what is the consumer or the industry uh, mindset has been to think about a quantum leap in, in the te te telecommunication technology. When you look at the scale that we have, um, it's a global operation. Uh, we have uh, data for the map for more than 250 countries. We have employees in more than 56 countries. We power uh, an astronomical number of uh, application and services. Our platform runs at about 80 billion uh, API calls. So all those devices connected are now pinging our platform at a, at a fast uh, rate and growing. Um, and uh, every auto OEM is our customer uh, in one way, shape, or form. So that's, if you will, introduction, uh, the introduction to here technologies. We are therefore facing today with 5G arriving another change into what a map or a location service really means. We went from that way of thinking about a map as a 2D image that you render on your phone or on the screen of the connected car, and you go from one place to the other, and you have a routing and you have a guidance, and that's, if you will, what people think of map. But the reality is now evolving towards a world where the 3D representation of the world is important. Curvature of a city, I live in San Francisco, and you see here on the second vignette, a different 3D view of the same location that I put on the first vignette. This is close to the uh, waterfront by Fisherman's Wharf. And now we're looking towards the pyramid and the evolution of the user interfaces in that connected car are getting to a point of sophistication to always push the boundary of what is possible with the technology. And more and more auto OEMs are actually looking at 3D rendition of the map to make the map, the map uh, very pleasing. We actually did a, a demonstrator of what is possible with our friends at Unity, which is also driving 3D uh, into the technology field. To make that 3D representation of the world, we actually are going back to the source. We run a fleet of cars equipped with lasers and high uh, quality cameras, and we make a digital twin of the world. That's the third vignette. And that digital twin of the world, we have a few versions of it, depending on the um, precision, the accuracy, what is the interest uh, around uh, the object that a provider, a telco operator, a car maker needs. But we're making very, very precise map of the world. For example, here you're seeing Broadway Avenue in New York. And we have an object, a data set, that enables a telco operator to actually plan the deployment of their 5G infrastructure 
especially for interests in line of thinking about millimeter wave, because when you have trees on the leaf, uh, when you have leaves on the trees of a particular area, it's going to be cutting the 5G millimeter wave signal. And therefore, cell planning, network planning, uh, cell, small cell placement is dependent and the capital investment that the telco operator today is having to make uh, is dependent on a precise understanding of the geometry of the world where that infrastructure is going to go. And so we do see at here technologies, the evolution and the different strategies that all the telco operators are employing between 5G millimeter wave to mid band to low band and how that plays out into their deployment strategies and how the automotive OEMs are thinking about 5G deployment in that context. A automotive OEM will have to therefore think about what is the service that is now available in a downtown urban center where I have 5G millimeter wave deployed by opposition to what's available in the suburbia where I may only face mid band all the way down to the highway that may be equipped with 5G millimeter wave but when I take off the off highway off ramp, I'm now on low band because on, I am in a more rural area. Those are the conversations that we are helping power and helping both sets of the uh, marketplace uh, design their systems for. And then the next version of the map is a map made of objects and movements and captors and sensors and data. Grant made an excellent presentation about all the types of data sets that a car can produce, its location, whether it, the temperature, whether the uh, driver has applied the brake pedal at that moment, maybe there's a hazard uh, right in front of the road, the ability to see with cameras a pothole on lane three of the highway, the ability to know that you're having high density of traffic, the ability to ultimately, as the automotive industry is moving from connected car to autonomous driving with all these five classes of autonomy, you end up also looking at precise positioning, understanding the lane direction. You cannot suddenly have a car go from lane one to lane five of the highway and ask it to do the, the, the drive so quickly. So there is a need for understanding the lanes. We have a here product, here lanes, that builds that map in support of an ecosystem of data that moves in into our systems and ultimately one day will also be processed at the edge of the network. So what does that mean? That all this complexity that Grant uh, I have talked about that we are seeing, we actually believe that it really takes partnerships between the private sector, multiple companies, multiple vendors, integration to be done with careful thinking and planning of an evolution of the services that can be deployed at scale simply for the consumer. When you're in a car, you have to pay attention so you cannot be distracted. It takes data, it takes a platform, and it takes innovation. We are at a great time of uncertainty and innovation where lots of different players are taking big bets. But I also believe that it takes partnerships with the public sector to be able to also connect, because when Grant talks about this connected V2X with a car talking to the infrastructure or the smart city, the intermediate transportation system, you need to have actors who are going to come to the table and actually discuss what is the data they're willing to exchange, where does the data reside, what is the exchange of value between all those components. And building ecosystem uh, ecosystems is what we know how to do. We ourselves uh, are partnering with many, many players in the market. It is fascinating to see that many of what we call our customer relationships are more and more evolving towards, frankly, partnerships, where we are having deep conversations about data exchanges, com uh, enhancing data, paying attention to ultimately the, the end consumer. Because in the in a world of privacy regulations and the arrival on the North American continent of of regulations, um, we are tracking very well the uh, what is going on in the United States about location, uh, a federal uh, bill that one day will be introducing in Congress, a little akin to the European GDPR model. Consumer first, privacy first, view of location intelligence with an ecosystem of players 
that is well or orchestrated uh, around, uh, around all of this. We, with our industry history, are bringing a lot of global partnerships to the table to actually do all of this. So I'll finish by saying that when we try to think about all of this, we're observing a couple of things at this stage in the market development. One is that the automotive customers, OEM partners and clients of ours and, and market players are paying attention a lot to the concept of um, safety. The ability to bring in more advanced safety services that are going to make the car safer, where the car is going to be trending towards you know, zero congestion, zero emission, of course, with electrification. We are seeing a big trend around uh, making that connected object much safer. Um, yes, we are hearing it's a mobile phone on with wheels in which you sit. Uh, the reality is that it's also much more mission critical to do this well. And so partnerships with companies like Amazon, we're also a partner of Amazon with uh, our friends at uh, BlackBerry are essential to actually bring the best of breed technologies there. Second is that the integration, you're seeing here a couple of vignettes, uh, the second to the, from the right, uh, uh, innovation with Delco uh, World. Uh, we have done some um, innovation POCs with our friends at Verizon for collision avoidance and being able to send alert signals to that ADAS system, to that autonomous driving and, and driver assistance system when you can see things, but most importantly, when you cannot see them. Blind intersections, understanding what is the, in the trajectory or the possible trajectory of that vehicle is important. We're seeing a lot of work and innovation for the foreseeable two years. Now we're talking about investment today to actually build the next level of safety in those, in those environments. And then third is a question that I'll probably launch for the, for the debate. Um, what are the classes of data and the public-private partnerships that need to be, to be stricken in Europe, because we're a player in Europe, we do see that the European Union is very clear on what data sets must be made available by automotive OEMs in support of safety use cases. And the European Union has a classification of five tiers of data, maybe three would be enough. One with neutrality of access, and transparency of access and fair and reasonable use access for some of the data that is necessary for those intelligent transportation systems. Then data that will be shared on a fair and equitable basis between commercial vendors where a commercial player will make money off exploitation of that data. And the third one is proprietary data reserved by the OEM for building their own personalization, their own proprietary, their own unique experiences. We are just at the beginning of discovering all of this, but when we think about our data strategy around location, privacy first location intelligence, connected cars talking to the infrastructure, and the regulations around the use and the, and, uh, and the rules around data, those are the key themes that occupy uh, most of my time and the time of many of my colleagues behind me uh, these days. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, I'll pass it on back to Grant, uh, to Eric. Um, merci à vous tous pour votre attention. Oh, thanks a lot, Hervé. That was great. And uh, so we're going to move on to sort of a moderated uh, Q&A. So I think we invite both Grant and Hervé back to the to the main stage so people can see them. And um, uh I think I'll start, you know, with you, Grant. Um, you know, obviously, one of the areas that we at CWTA are interested in is the connectivity part, um, and in particular with cellular connectivity. And I know for a number of years there was a, a debate as to what role cellular connectivity might play in the connected car, and definitely there was uh, there was some momentum around other standards like DSRC. And I'm just wondering if uh, you can just just briefly kind of just give an overview of what, what that evolution was and how we've kind of moved, I think, from at least from my outsider's view, from a DSRC kind of 
being prioritized to more cellular uh, V to X. Okay. And not that you'd have a biased opinion in any way. Not at all. Not at all, no. <laughs> I think, purveying myself, I mean, a lot of people have seen that, that I'll say, um, evolution. Um, the battle is still ongoing. I mean, DSRC had a big head start, obviously. Uh, it was introduced in 1999. Um, and, you know, it, the other thing is, well, I think I, I should talk a bit about terminology because you'll hear words like DSRC or dedicated short range excuse me, communications, you'll hear 802.11p, you'll hear ITS-G5, they all kind of mean the same thing, or they're used interchangeably, I should probably say, and I'll relate to Wi-Fi, obviously, CV2X is cellular backed by the 3GPP, so as much as the SRC had a big head start, really, it's been, I'll say, slow going. Um, and in fact, yeah, the SRC introduced in 99. Uh, then in 2016, you had the National Highway Transportation Safety Association, or more commonly known as NHTSA, in the U.S., uh, released a uh, notice of proposed rulemaking to mandate the SRC for V2V. So that was a bit of a, a wake-up call, if you like, or a decision that was made. But again, it was just a proposal. In 2017, you had Cadillac CTS vehicles um, that were powered by, or that were DSRC enabled. And by the way, they were also based on uh, on QNICs. And then in 19, you had the EU that's saying they're going to be technology neutral, which opened the door to cellular vehicle communications. <laughs> So since then, you're seeing a lot of announcements and whatnot um, um, from uh, related to DSRC and, and CV2X. There's a 5GAA association, uh, 5G Automotive Association, obviously, it's backing CV2X. Um, and I think we're still divided, but I'm with you, Eric, in the sense that the momentum seems to be really behind cellular communication. The nice thing about CV2X and DSRC is the message format is the same. They're both secure, but of course they need completely different radios. So in other words, I either put a chip in the car that can support both, or I or I, or I make a decision, or I implement two, which is obviously a, a cost issue. Uh, China's leading towards CV2X. Uh, Ford, uh, they've announced CV2X in their vehicles by 2022. And then you've got VW recently saying they're going to ship, uh, and probably are shipping, uh, DSRC-equipped vehicles. So we're still a bit fragmented. I do see more momentum on C, uh, the cellular communications. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, the industry, everybody realized it's important for a lot of the reasons that uh, Herve mentioned. And it was a great presentation, by the way. Um, but everything from tracking management, environmental benefits, you know, safety, I mean, absolutely. Um, but mass adoption, and, and I think Robert touched on it earlier, Herve touched on it as well. It's going to require a lot of partnerships, a lot of investment um, from various levels of government, from industry, from regulators. We still have a lot of work to do. The, the value recognized in the connectivity, absolutely no question. Now, whether uh, it's going to be 5G, CV2X, I personally think that's exactly where it's going, and that will be the dominant V to V2X um, um, connectivity mechanism. Um, but we've, we still have a ways to go. Um, there's, again, a lot of investment in infrastructure. Uh, people put DSRC modems in their vehicles, as I mentioned earlier, but it was lonely. There was no one to talk to. Um, so we don't want to be in that situation again. And again, a lot of investment, a lot of standardization, as Herve mentioned, definitely with an eye on security, definitely with an eye on privacy. Um, work to do. It's coming. I think you're going to see the modems in the car. Back to what I was saying earlier, a vehicle to cloud, because that's right now the biggest consumer uh, use case for data. And then you're going to see now that the modem's in the vehicle, I think personally, you'll start to see alignment around CV2X. Thanks, thanks Grant. And, and Irvi, I, I noted in one of uh, here technology's white, recent white papers, which uh, if it's not up there already, we'll have on our 5gcc.ca website for people who want to take a look at it. Um, there's a quote, it says, in new, no generation of mobile technology has location intelligence been more critical or more precise than in, than in 5G. And I, I was struck, you know, the history, when you're going over the history of your company, starting with Navtech in 85, uh, it, it kind of runs in parallel to sort of the, the history of cellular connectivity, mobile connectivity. And obviously, location data is dependent on a couple of things in terms of its use in a connected way. Uh, the capability of the connected device, its computing power, what it can do, as well as the capabilities of the connections that uh, cellular technology can provide. So what is it about 5G? You mentioned talking about mission critical things, et cetera. What is the capabilities of 5G that are really important to the, some of the solutions that here technologies provides? 
So, so one of the things that we're observing is that the telecommunication industry is maybe still struggling to explain what 5G really brings. Um, because when you get to the table, I see too many uh, industry players come to it thinking, ah, it's a bigger pipe of data, downstream and upstream. And there is in the industry probably still a global lack um, at scale, not in this audience, but in the industry, understanding network slicing and the ability to protect and to guarantee a particular bandwidth to a specific uh, uh, device and the ability to actually have uh, always on connectivity. Latency is still misunderstood. And we are spending a lot of time with automotive OEMs trying to find what are the use cases where millisecond level latency between in that connection between that antenna, that edge compute, that intelligent uh, street light system is going to be maybe to the ambulance for which the telco operator has promised and guaranteed a 5G link of quality on the route that we're routing them. So bandwidth, of course, um, network slicing, uh, latency. One that is really, really intriguing to us as a location services provider is the localization of the processing of the data. When you're having suddenly in a dense urban center, 50,000 connected cars that are going to be emitting some data still to be defined, talking to the uh, infrastructure around them, maybe talking to one another, within the confine of one single brand family, talking to the underlying uh, counters uh, in the streets that are counting the cars, talking to the infrastructure that may one day be making that lane payable on demand with a premium to drive on that lane. Right now, we're, uh, uh, we are at what I personally consider stage one of that infrastructure. Um, you're having such a noisy network that you need to localize the processing of all that data. And the industry is therefore looking today for the right alignment of the funding, the return on investment, the partnerships that need to be built, and a certain sense of targeted deployment where, frankly, we're going to, all of this complexity is going to resolve itself into localization, if you will, of the value-added services that this connected car suddenly accesses in a dense urban center, then going to the suburbia, then going to the highway, then going to the uh, road in the countryside. And the regulators, by the way, have in that environment something to say, because if you want equality of treatment of all the uh, taxpayers and the citizens who are actually ultimately uh, reaping the benefits of that innovation, that's the march of the next 10 years that we're all embarked on. Um, I, I think it's going to take that long for all of those things to start clarifying. Thanks. And, and I was going to ask you as well, Herve, uh, you touched upon you know, the public sector's role. And I was just curious as well. I mean, we're obviously talking about how connected cars can make the driving experience better, can make it safer, et cetera. But we have you know, members in our audience who come from different levels of government. Some of them are responsible for managing those transportation systems, you know, dealing with the volume of traffic, trying to make the roads safer, trying to make it safer for pedestrians, cyclists, et cetera. How can location data, if, you know, if someone from a municipality came to you and said, how can location data help us manage these vehicles, these people, these cyclists. Do you have solutions that address that as well? We do. So today, you, typically those conversations will start at understanding the past to predict the future, right? And to looking at trends. So one of the data sets that we have, you saw in the little vignette of San Francisco that I was showing, you saw some streets coded in green, yellow, and red. How do you get to that understanding of that street at that point of time historically over the past two to three years, what was the traffic on that street? We have data sets that enable to do that. They come from our partner and relationships with our data providers that are feeding uh, traffic information into our systems and we make that available. You can then look at a specific geofence of interest and bring in that data 
uh, into your data systems if you're sophisticated and, and you have a, an IT department capable of doing it. Or we can do it for you and build a system, a web console interface uh, on top of our platform. That's, that's today. Where this is headed is the predictive aspect of things. What will happen when suddenly I now have um, a green wave ready infrastructure of street lights? What happens if my fire department and my ambulances are now connected to the 5G brought to the market, to the city in that area? How can I reroute them along a specific route that is going to be a combination of the traffic information at that particular point of time and the 5G network signal that I know is on all road links. Today, we have a cellular signal data set that enables to predictively say and know what will be the signal strength on a particular road segment at a particular location. This is how the automotive OEMs today are able to trigger. You heard uh, uh, the CEO of Ford talk about those over the air uh, data downloads into those connected cars. You can predict them and you can schedule them to a specific car today with some of the data sets that we have. I'm, I'm being a little tactical and tangible here, but this to illustrate what is happening today and where this is headed. Oh, that's great, thanks. And um, Grant, I'm curious. So I know you drive a 1960 something Mustang, right? And yeah. it's not a connected car, <laughs> except for when you have your smartphone in it. And you know, a lot of us who are who are older, our experience with a car is you, you know, a new car, you go to a dealer, you buy it, you drop it off, drive it off the lot, and you may never deal with the dealer or the OEM again. Uh, you may never have a relationship with them other unless they send you a recall notice or something. Yeah. Um, but obviously, you know, the OEMs are not building in connected, connected uh, capabilities and all these other types of services. Um, just to be nice and to to make make the experience better. Yeah. How are they How are they utilizing this or looking at this as a way to create sort of a more stickiness relationship with the customer, and also you know generating revenue and saving costs? Yeah, no, good question. You're absolutely right. Uh, I do drive a '66 Mustang convertible, um, which has no electronics in it at all and no connectivity at all. Um, and that's not why I put the Ford slide on my deck, by the way, in case anybody's wondering. Um, but to your point, the OEMs used to, I mean, the model essentially work through dealers, the traditional model, um, sell the vehicle, and then it was, okay, talk to you in four years, you know, unless there was a recall or more years. I mean, obviously the longevity or the life cycle of the vehicle, uh, depending what you look at, can be, you know, on average, I think 10, 11 years. Um, what connectivity allows them to do, what 5G is going to allow them to do is, to your point, have that ongoing relationship with the consumer. All, and the use cases are, are honestly tremendous. Um, I mentioned some of them earlier. They'll be able to find out more about, you know, how you're using your vehicle. They'll be able to deliver software for updates to improve safety, improve security of the vehicle, uh, deliver new features, for instance, that you could try before you buy, um, essentially in the vehicle. So they'll be able to build that relationship with the, with the vehicle owner, with the drivers of the vehicle, um, and do so on an ongoing basis, which has been a real challenge for them today. So on the monetization front, for instance, they'll be able to deliver features to you, uh, whether it's mapping services and whatnot, or other features, that you can experiment, you can try, and then you could subscribe to on a subscription basis. So just, and even today you see, you can actually have a subscription for a vehicle. Uh, we've seen it with Porsche and others, for instance, but connectivity is gonna give them that communication, if you like, directly with the car and insights that you can only get by having direct connectivity with the car. As much as you can have a mobile phone and have connectivity, you won't have the same insights that you have if you're directly connected into the networks in the car, to the systems in the car, to know how they're behaving, to know how the driver or passenger is interacting with the system, for instance. Um, there's a, there was a case, uh, we were talking to a number of OEMs, and you know one of them was they wanted to get some insight, more insight, into when a, when a vehicle's operating autonomously or in an autom automated fashion, I should say, when there's a disengagement 
they're trying to get more insight. Why did the driver take over? Why did that the disengagement essentially when the vehicle's operating in an automated fashion and the operator of the vehicle takes over? You know, what? why was that? So they want to be able to gather data in the seconds or, or minute or so before that. And then all the environmental data from all the sensors, for instance, be able to package that up intelligently and then deliver that. So again, they can gather more intelligence. And everybody talked about the whole notion of environmental data and whatnot. If they can continually add value, then absolutely they'll be able to monetize that value. But also, as I mentioned, there's tremendous operational savings that they can realize as well. And again, not to mention the building of the relationship with the consumer, which connectivity 5G is going to give them more than they've ever had before. Yeah. Um, we only have a few minutes left, so I have to be mindful of that. And I do want to get to a couple uh, uh, attendee questions or viewer questions as well. But one last one, and I'll just ask a, a, for a quick response. Irving mentioned some of the regulate, regulatory activities taking place in the EU around the use of data. Um, the sort of using some of the data for the common good versus some that is that sort of remains proprietary. And I'm just wondering, is there's, I know it's early on and I know there's discussions going on in industry, but what is the industry's attitude to, is assuming the regu regulation of that use of data is, is harmonious across jurisdictions, so you don't have a huge patchwork, but will, do you believe everybody that regulation will at least give people some certainty as how they can move forward rather than being in a sort of under a, sort of the wild west type view where you have to, you don't really know what ultimately is gonna be allowed and not allowed in the future? Um, hard to predict, you're bringing me back to my youth in the Silicon Valley when I arrived in here in the US as a young Frenchman manager in a tech company, I was working in digital television at the time. And I observed at the time that Europe was taking a, a standards and regulatory approach to MPEG-2 standardization in one field. And the US, large large market player, uh, large market with large players, decided to standardize. And there was the fight between DirecTV that had its DSS uh, video encoding and transport schema. And then it resolved itself, but it took 15 years to resolve itself into the international standardization bodies. I suspect that we're going to see the same behavior here of the re regulatory zones uh, because the North American market is large enough for extremely large players to ultimately bring in, invent, build IP, build large scale commercial agreements. And so it is the public good aspect of that data, that, that safety, that, what, that base level, which I think here we're going to see in the North American market, the regulator have to think about. We build a product called the here neutral server to precisely support our European OEM customers in that safe, neutral exchange of data that supports that common good safety oriented use case. And it is now in use in Europe between automotive OEMs that have connected cars out there. They're exchanging data so that, for example, if you actually see one car from one brand hit the brakes on the highway, in Germany at 200 miles an hour, that's how fast they drive over there, you're going to have the car, the driver of the car run, driving 500 meters behind him actually get a message that an event is happening ahead of him. That's the type of cooperation that this neutral server, if you will, uh, applies. So we are a little bit maybe in advance of, of the market from what we see in Europe to where we're headed in North American market. No, that's fascinating. Well, I, I, I want to thank you both. I, I do want to address a couple of questions we had, uh, and I'll, I'll just quickly answer them. Angelo had a question about the, the role of 5G really in, in the factory and the manufacturing uh, plants and, and talked about uh, how uh, some of the major OEMs are starting to use 5G for you know private networks, et cetera. Definitely, that's a very very important uh, use of 5G. And we, we plan to have a, a, an event in the future, in the coming months, around industrial uh, 4.0 and a smart factory. So please stay tuned for that. And also just want to acknowledge uh, Joanne, who rightfully pointed out how the FCC uh, basically uh, 
They had reserved spectrum for DSRC back in 1999, as, as Grant pointed out, uh, but they recently have uh, opened up that spectrum to use with Wi-Fi. So that kind of has been seen as putting a bit of a, maybe a hurdle or death nail on DSRC, at least in the US. But as Grant says, we'll still see what happens going forward. So again, thank you very much, Grant. And Hervé, this is great. I, I have you know probably about 100 other questions I could ask you. I wish we had more time. But for now, I'll just turn it back to Robert for just some closing remarks. Great. Well, thank you, uh, Eric and, uh, and Grant. And merci à Hervé uh, pour uh, uh, votre présentation aujourd'hui. Uh, you know, it's uh, the future is exciting. Um, as I think I've, I've met with Grant before at his uh, headquarters there. And, you know, it's a constant evolution on what's happening uh, with uh, the automobile today. And uh, who knows where we'll be in four, eight, ten years uh, down the road. But I think uh, from today's presentation, we learned that uh, things are going to be uh, safer. Things are going to be smarter. Things are going to be uh, able to do things in a in a faster manner. Um, so it's th there's an exciting time ahead. So I want to thank uh, all three of you for uh, for being involved. I want to thank everyone for watching. Uh, this has been our third event. Uh, we're planning on doing more into the future. Of course, in the past we did one live event uh, every year, uh, but unfortunately uh, with COVID that didn't happen. So hopefully we'll get a chance to do live events uh, into the future. But we are planning to take a summer break and then coming back in hopefully September uh, to be able to uh, have uh, a few more of these uh, virtual conferences. So uh, if you've missed any of our previous events, you can find them on our 5G website at 5gcc.ca uh, and look for the button uh, and look for the 5G Canada What's Next button. Uh, you can also subscribe to our 5G Canada newsletter on that website by looking for the industry news tab. Thank you and uh, have a great day.